When I was young, I asked my mother one of those questions. I said, Mummy, why do we have legs instead of wheels? I took a stunned silence as being indicative that we were just poorly designed machines. Then I shot out at the kitchen into my laboratory. Here it is, and this is me in the middle of the picture. I have my hammer above my head, I have my sister in tow, and I'm striking a pose like a bounty hunter, because we're ready to go creepy crawly hunting. You know, in those days, and even as I grew, I had absolutely no idea just how much machines shaped my reality. And I'm not just talking about how devices make things easier. I'm talking about the way that I thought about everything. For starters, I thought I was a machine. I also used machines to describe how things worked even when they weren't machines. So I'd say that the Earth orbited the sun the way that hands swept around a giant clock face. Or I used machines to help me describe how reality was made out of tiny objects, all cleverly strung together. And machines helped me imagine my own future. I'd become part of social machinery, where I'd play the role of a particular part. And of course, I wanted to be a scientist, so I could figure out how the little objects of reality were strung together, so then when something was broken, I could fix it. Machine thinking's been around for a long time. Earlier this year, I went to the Leonardo da Vinci Museum in Venice, where there's a large collection of his machines. Now, the ones that captured my imagination most were those that were designed to address the challenge of human flight, some were like bird's wings, others like box kites, some like corkscrews. And as I studied the drawings and the models, I started to realize that machines in Leonardo da Vinci's day were very different to our own. About 150 years ago, developments in science and engineering gave rise to the combustion engine. Now, this device enabled us to take energy from nature and turn it into power that could be used to drive any machine. It gave us access to the world's resources on a scale and down to a degree that was previously unimaginable. And it precipitated cultural, social, technological changes, which we now call the Industrial Revolution. Industrialists have become very wealthy, and industrialized nations have seen a great rise in their standard of living. But all this progress has come with a price. It distanced us from nature. Back in my laboratory, I was designing ecological machines for the creepy crawlies that my sister and I had collected to live in. So we got together jam jars and bottles and screws and twigs and leaves and sand and soil and water and sugar and salt, and we used these as components to design the perfect machine in which all the creepy crawlies could live together in peace and harmony. Well, no matter how we rearranged those components, we couldn't get our experiments to work. And looking back on it, obviously the experimental design was somewhat naive, and the ambition was pretty grand. And yet, during this exploratory period, I learned something very important. That when I make a machine, I'm interfering with a relationship that exists between a creature and its surroundings. And although my machines can dictate the circumstances to which my creatures needed to respond, they never gave anything back to my tiny communities. And this so frustrated me. But it wasn't just true of the machines that I made in my garden. This was true of the machines that we have today. They're ecologically and environmentally belligerent. Yet, we surround ourselves with them. They're in our homes. We drive to work in them. They even encircle the planet as naturally as the stars do. And because we share such intimacy with our machines, we also live in their waste. In the evening, my mother would come along and she'd empty out the sticky solutions of drowned insects and crystallized creepy crawlies, just so I could start again afresh the next day. But Mother Nature doesn't come and clean up after us. And nor does she interfere in our toxic living love affair that we're having with our machines. And we're caught in this spiral of escalating consumption, destruction, pollution, and we don't seem to know how to get out of it. We're stuck. 
Albert Einstein once said that when you have a problem, you don't go looking to the issues that created it in the first place for the solution. But that's exactly what we're doing. And despite reassurances that there are indeed sustainable ways to go around using fundamentally industrial technologies by recycling things or using slightly less energy, I think this is just green lipstick on the industrial gorilla's lips. It's a thinly veiled attempt to mask our dependency and desire for industrialization. And it's an obstacle. It's getting in our way of doing something completely different. Because less of more of the same kind of thing is not different. But how are we as children of the Industrial Revolution ever going to think of an existence beyond the machine? You know, our entire world is made up of them, and nobody wants to go backwards. What I learned from my visit to the museum in Venice was that when Leonardo da Vinci was faced with a challenge, he looked at it from many different angles. And his technology was the way that his mind was becoming embodied in the process of problem solving. And that although he was a genius, he needed to practice thinking differently. And that's what I'd like us to do right now. I'd like us to practice thinking differently. So I'd like you to join me in a thought experiment. So this experiment's in two parts. Okay? The first part is relatively straightforward. Second part is a little bit more tricky, but I'm sure you'll manage it. Okay. This is an ordinary ice cube. No tricks. As children of the Industrial Revolution, you will look at this ice cube and you will probably see an object. You will also know from your knowledge of physics and chemistry that heat from the surroundings is passing into the ice cube and it is melting. You will probably consider that this ice cube is being destroyed by this process. Okay, that's the end of the first part of the experiment. Here comes the second part. Same ice cube. This is not an object. This is a flexible system that can respond to its environmental surroundings. As before, heat is coming from the surroundings and passing into the ice cube. It is melting, and some of it is dripping onto the carpet here. And some of it is turning into water vapor. And some of you in the front row will be breathing in some of these molecules later on. And it will become part of your bodies, and your bodies will set them in motion towards a new future. But in this case, we could consider that the ice cube is being transformed by this process. OK, that's the end of the experiment. So as you can see, exactly the same thing is happening in both cases. But depending on how we frame our observations and how we start to analyze what is happening, we can challenge some basic assumptions that we might have in both those cases. So let's take the second case, for starters. We can use that to challenge some assumptions we might have had in the first case. So using the second framework, we could wonder whether that ice cube was ever an object with a discrete boundary and a finite set of molecules. Some of you might be using the second framework to think, well, maybe we could use such a system to create a technology that doesn't just take from its environment and stop at the process of destruction, but can actually go onwards and transform the matter that it's dealing with. So we've actually got a creative kind of technology. And some of you, more skeptical, may be thinking, yeah, but that's just water. Water's got a particular set of properties. We can't make everything out of water and ice. That doesn't work. But I'd say you're wrong, because everything that we think of as being an object is undergoing these kinds of processes. It's just a question of time. Buildings decay. Roads crumble if we don't maintain them. Even our own bodies, from the moment we're conceived to the second that we pass on, we're changing. And when we try to stop these processes, we either have to spend a hell of a lot of energy trying to do it, or we can't stop them at all. So why not go with the flow? Well, that's all very well, but how are we going to make a technology out of that? That's, that's an idea, right? Well, we don't have to make a technology out of it, because in the last 20 years or so, a new practice called synthetic biology has been doing exactly this. 
It's been producing real-world technologies that can connect with the environment through flexible networks of chemical exchange. Now, these are normally found in living systems. Synthetic biology gives us tools through which we can design and engineer these systems, so we can think of them as being living technology. Now, living technology is a relatively new idea. We don't know exactly how it works, and we don't know exactly what circumstances it's best applied to. But it's new. In fact, it's so new that if you came across one, you probably wouldn't recognize it as being a technology. It doesn't have an on-off button. It doesn't have an electrical cable. It's not cold and hard and dry to the touch, but warm and soft and kind of soggy because it's different, and that's important. Armed with a very different kind of technology, I returned to my childhood challenge to create a habitat that could connect its creatures to its environment. And this is my new laboratory, the city of Venice, which stands on the shores of a lagoon by the Adriatic Sea in northern Italy. Venice faces an uncertain future, mainly due to rising sea levels, which flood the city periodically in a phenomenon called the aqua alta and brings chemical and physical destruction. The challenge then was to find a technology that could literally equip the city, the fabric of the city itself, with the capacity to fight back against the elements in a struggle for survival. And this is the technology that we chose. It's a drawing of a real-world system called the protocell. These are oil droplets that are programmable using chemistry. And when you program them, they actually have lifelike properties. They can move around their environment. They can sense it. They can even build microstructures. And so when we have this technology, we can actually create a design for it. We can think how we can program the technology to respond to sunlight that's in the canals and move down underneath the foundations of Venice, which are dark. And Venice stands on wood piles. So the technology arrives in the darkness, and it can use local resources. It takes dissolved minerals and carbon dioxide and turns them into an accretion technology. It creates an artificial limestone reef underneath the foundations of Venice and spreads the weight of the city from being on a narrow pole to being on a much larger surface area. And so, essentially, Venice becomes reclaimed by an organic technology that can literally grow underneath its foundations and, and prevents the city from being eroded because it has this healing growth and repair mechanism that's embodied in its fabric. Now, obviously, Venice faces many more challenges in terms of its future survival than just sinking down into the mud. And our technology is at its earliest stages of development. It's um, it got to face real-world challenges on many different scales before it even starts to become implemented in the real world. But the protocell technology is important. It's important because it's new. It's a new way of making. It's a new way of using local resources. And it's a new kind of technology that doesn't just take things from the environment, it gives something meaningful back too. And when we can think about these kinds of design principles, we can start designing them or even seeing them elsewhere. For example, the oil company Shell now feeds emissions from its power plants down into the soil. Soil is a naturally occurring living technology. It's very chemically complex. And this can turn the emissions into products that can be used to feed plants. Another company, Sustainable Now Technologies in California, where the crude oil rush began, they're making bioreactors. These are aquariums filled with little green algae. And the green algae can take sunlight and carbon dioxide and turn them into liquid fuel. And we can design these for the outside of buildings, so we can make oils locally. Now, none of these technologies on their own constitute a revolution in making. But I believe that we're at a turning point. From this moment onwards, we can imagine how our successive generations can increase the wealth of the Earth, not diminish it. And I base my optimism on my own experiments in soil and mud and technology and innovation. And I hope there are thousands of little girls and boys out there in their back gardens digging down into the earth with their spoons, trying to figure out 
what this reality is. And I hope some of them go running into their parents and demand, why? Why did cars have wheels instead of legs? And I hope that we, as children of the Industrial Revolution, respond to their wide-eyed ideas and crazy dreams with support and encouragement and do not incarcerate them in dogmas and disappointments of our own making and call it education. We really need to keep these frameworks of thinking, these fresh frameworks of thinking, wide, wide open, not just ch for children, but for all of us, for the whole of our lives. Because when it comes down to a really positive future for humanity, the creativity that we possess, when the mind becomes embodied in the process of problem solving, is the most powerful technology that we have. Thank you.